Well, I think, yeah, you know, we might as well get things uh, kicked off here. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're starting up the Tech Talk series again. I'll, I'm going to share my screen here so we can all look at that. And um, where are we here? So I wanted to show you the Tech Talks there. So uh, yeah, we're, we're having another uh, series of five talks this quarter. Um, so every other week, bi-weekly, this is the first one. Uh, we, we're, we're gonna do some more AI and robotics this quarter because we have so much of that work going on and you know, next quarter we'll, we'll shift to some other, some other areas. We've got these five faculty who are, who are lined up and uh, we'll have their abstracts and titles there soon, but uh, should, should be a good set of talks, very different types of topics. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy that. And today, um, well, I, I usually introduce the speaker, but I am the speaker. So uh, I don't have to learn to pronounce my name or, uh, or uh, study my bio. Um, I'll just say a little bit. Um, I, so I'm Alan Fern. I, uh, I have been here at OSU for 17 years now. Um, I work in AI and robotics and um, went to uh, Purdue for my grad school, uh, studied various types of AI technologies there and directly came here. And I've been teaching here ever since and doing research. Um, let's see, I've got, I'm just trying to get some, I'll stake co-host. Co so, yeah, one, one thing that I want to point out is today's talk, um, it's gonna be a slightly, uh, it's gonna be a less technical talk than I would give to a, an academic audience. But if you want a more technical version of this talk, uh, I, in the chat, I posted a place where you can go see uh, the technical version um, uh, talk that I gave uh, last, I think it was December, November, something like that. But, uh, but it, go, it has a lot more uh, technical details and a slightly different flavor. But today, uh, yeah, I'm hoping to, it'll be a fun talk and we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to see the relationship to some of your projects perhaps. And so, yeah, without further ado, we'll, we'll just get started. Um, if you have questions, I, I don't mind if you, uh, I probably won't see the chat uh, easily. Um, so I don't mind if you unmute, and interrupt during the talk, but you can also just wait to the end. We'll try to leave time at the end. Um, I've got some material I can cut out if we get, get too far along. So yeah, this is the title. This is one title for today's talk, how to train your two-legged robot to stand, walk, run, hop, and skip. Uh, an alternative title for this crowd, uh, you know, I'd like to have this in the back of your mind and. At the very end, I'll come back to it. But uh, you know, this is really what I'm going to be talking about is a specific example of uh, what you can think of as an alternative paradigm for engineering complex control systems. And it's actually a paradigm I'm pretty excited about, and I want to start working with more people on these problems. Like, there's a couple of collaborators that that we're already starting to uh, to form some projects around. But, uh, but I, I really think this is a promising, uh, not quite technology, but, but it's not too far away either uh, for, for designing these control systems. So keep that in mind as you're watching this. So, so the work I'm gonna talk about today is uh, all done in the uh, dynamic, dynamic Robotics Lab here at OSU. Um, the lab was started by Jonathan Hurst, a uh, robotics professor, he's now, uh, he was uh, co-founder of Agility Robotics, which is a, a up and coming robotics company uh, that came out of OSU and is located in Albany um, right now. And we co-direct uh, the lab now. I'm the AI person and he's the robotics person. He's, he's got a much more mechanical slant to things than me. And I have a much more 
algorithmic slant and it's a very good combination. And I think that's really started to pay off. Uh, you know, it took about five years to get where we are, but, but it, it, it really, uh, really has paid off to have both points of view. We've got some great students currently working in the lab. Uh, there's a few others now, but these are the students that were involved in a lot of the work I'll show today. Uh, we have some, you know, these alumni that are now at Agility Robotics. They like to take our, uh, they like to hire our students sometimes earlier than we'd like, but uh, but that's great. Um, it's great for them, great for Agility. Um, and they, they've done a lot of work uh, that, that I'm gonna show today. Um, and we also have a robot the star of the show, uh, Cassie. And so you're gonna see Cassie doing things like skipping today. Uh, and, uh, and that's our lab's only robot. And this joke's getting a little old now, but uh, I've also been, uh, it's also been claimed that I'm a robot. I've heard this in course reviews and things like that. I have no evidence to the contrary. Um, it may be a compliment, I, I don't know, but uh, we can, uh, so this is our team uh, and yeah, it's been really great working uh, in this group for the last five, six years. Uh, some of the funnest, uh, funnest research I've done since I've been a professor. So without further ado, let's uh, talk about a problem that you might not think of as robotics, but, but it's a control problem. And I, I, I like to talk about a simple control problem before we get into complex ones, just so we can set the stage. And, and this is a control problem most of you are familiar with, uh, it's automatic speed control or cruise control. Um, and this has been around for a while. So the first cruise control was uh, by Chrysler in 1958. And they, I think this is a generous um, title for, for cruise control. They called it autopilot. We get upset when Elon Musk calls his thing autopilot sometimes, but uh, they call it autopilot for a little bit and they changed the name. I, I guess they might have, I don't know if people took their hands off the wheel and thought this thing could drive itself or, or not, but uh, they don't call it autopilot anymore. But this is a very classic control problem that you can more or less solve with textbook techniques. Uh, and, and let's set this up as in a general control framework. So automatic control involves these things. So you have goals, sensing, intelligence, and action. And so we're, you know, what we're gonna talk about in the talk today is this intelligence. So how do we develop this intelligence uh, for control? And what goes into the intelligence is the goal. Um, they had a dial here for, for the speed and it goes one to, I don't know, what, I, don't, I don't know what the units were here, but um, there was some dial and it says how fast do you wanna go? Uh, the current speed, that's our sensing. Uh, you know, nowadays they have more sensors on the cars, but you at least had a speedometer. And from that, the intelligence has to figure out, well, what, what kind of acceleration do I want to apply and what kind of braking do I want to apply? So there's some intelligence here. And, and as I said, uh, this, this uh, cruise control problem is more or less textbook uh, control. Like, so you can look at a textbook and figure out how to solve this thing. It's not much more than PID control. Uh, you know, so, so there's a, yeah, a long literature on this problem. Now, the type of problem we're gonna talk about today is a little bit more complex, maybe a lot more complex. And, and this, this video epitomizes what, what I'm talking about. So I'm interested in controlling bipedal locomotion. And you see this, this uh, infant here has really mastered, you know, to some degree, uh, bipedal locomotion. And all of us do this every day. We hardly notice it. It's subconscious for the most part, if you're lucky. Um, and we do it very well. Yet it's a very, very hard control problem. And, and I, find, I find bipedal locomotion fascinating because it actually is thought to be one of the key turning points in, in hominid evolution. Uh, for, for various reasons, uh, when we started walking on two feet, as opposed to a knuckle walk, you know, which is what apes will do, 
um, which is not considered bipedalism, uh, we lost speed. So, so quadrupeds will beat us in a race, right? You're not going to beat most quadrupeds in a race, uh, but we gained efficiency, two times more efficiency, in fact. And that efficiency was very important. They think, for example, that uh, it let us basically chase animals to the point of them dying of hypothermia uh, because we were so efficient. We forced them to be in aerobic uh, activity for too long. And after a day of you know, sprinting and then resting, they, they just couldn't take any more. And we would just slowly methodically follow them with our endurance. So, so it was really a turning point and, and it's amazing the, the physical and, and sort of uh, control mechanisms that are needed to achieve this. We just don't uh, recognize how hard it is. So, so the problem is very hard. So, so we've got to control this body. These legs need to move in a way that will keep the body um, uh, stable, supported, deal with whatever terrain's coming up. And you know, the intelligence comes from our brain. And if we set this up as a control problem, the, the goal is, well, our brain also comes up with some desired locomotion goal. Like what's the desired locomotion? I wanna go to the fridge and, and, and get a beer or something, right? So I've gotta move my legs to, to do that. Um, the sensing, you've got thousands of nerves sending signals from the body. Uh, you've got nerves that you have to send action potentials through to control the, the muscles. And there's over 200 muscles. So this is a nasty control problem, right? Scary. If you compare it to a, a textbook control problem like speed control, um, you know, there the sensors are roughly one, the number of action outputs are two, right? The, the, the two pedals here. Uh, we compare that to this locomotion problem that we all solve every day. Um, well, we have thousands of inputs, hundreds of outputs, uh, your orders of magnitude different in the, in the input and output size, which is usually an indication of complexity. It doesn't have to be, but it, it's a pretty good uh, indicator. And so, so our research challenge is how can we engineer bipedal locomotion for robots, right? We're not gonna have as many sensors and actions, but we're still gonna have quite a few. Um, and we've got a challenging uh, control problem here. It's a traditional challenge in robotics for, to, to get robust uh, bipedal locomotion. And it, it really all starts with the hardware. Um, you know, one thing that I learned from, from Jonathan Hurst over the years and, and have come to believe is, is that uh, there's only so much that you can make up for in software. So if you have a bad physical hardware system uh, that's, that doesn't have the right dynamics, uh, inherent dynamics, you can only make up for those deficiencies so much in software. And so you might as well try to design the hardware to have the passive physical characteristics that you'd like um, and other, other physical characteristics uh, to have the right dynamics at the start, and then you have much less to make up for in software and it will make your job easier. That's one thing I've learned. And, and Jonathan spent a good part of his career, most of his career, um, uh, designing legs for robots that are exactly from that point of view. How can we make robot legs that are as close to animal legs as possible? Like they have the springiness, the passive dynamics, and he started out with this Atreus robot, this weird looking thing, but it's weird looking, but, but it also was uh, modeling animal dynamics very well. So this is the um, foot force profile of Atreus during one stepping cycle. And this is what you see from a human. So, uh, and, and this is also what you see from an ostrich or, or a lot, birds and other mammals that, that are bipeds. Um, birds, uh, well, yeah, I guess birds would be another major example of bipeds. Um, this design, for, there were some various inefficiencies in it, uh, transformed into Cassie, uh, which is 
you know, about four feet high, 70 pounds. Um, we don't quite know what the top speed is. We're trying to push that now, but it, it can, uh, it's a respectable speed. Um, good battery life, like, you know, one reason to look at bipeds and good physical designs is you get much better um, energy usage. Uh, and this was developed uh, here at OSU and then Agility Robotics started and they, they started manufacturing these for academic customers, um, learned a lot about you know, the production and how to, how to run a business from that. And now they're, they're uh, manufacturing digits and a uh, very exciting time for them. Uh, uh, so they, they don't manufacture Cassie anymore, but digit, you can see the legs are very similar as arms might be in a warehouse someday or delivering packages to your doorstep. That would be really cool. Today, we're gonna to talk about Cassie because that's what our lab has. We'd love to have the money to buy Digit, but not quite yet, we're saving our pennies. So, but there's a lot of cool things we can do with Cassie. So I'm gonna tell you about those today. Now, when we talk about walking, um, bipedal locomotion, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, what we're gonna to refer to as blind locomotion. So this is a locomotion when you have a blindfold on and humans can do this really well. I mean, get up right now and walk around the room with your eyes closed. You can do it. You can even jump and skip and hop and you'll, you'll be just fine. Uh, you can even try to go upstairs with your eyes closed. It might be a little scary and you might take it slow, but you can do it. Um, so, so really uh, visual perception and the ability to do robust locomotion are, are kind of decoupled. Um, and that, you know, the philosophy that we've started with is getting a visual perception stack is, is, is a lot of work just to get that up and going. And before we do that, and we're starting to do that now, we wanted to get the most robust uh, base to build on as far as a robust locomotion. Uh, just based on proprioceptive uh, sensing, which is just sensing about the positions and the velocities of your, of your joints. So, so that's our goal. Um, we want to achieve human level blind locomotion capabilities on, on a biped robot. And I wouldn't say we're at human level yet, but we, we've made a lot of interesting progress um, of late. So how might we approach this problem? Well. I'm not gonna talk about this today in detail, the details don't matter, but you know, our first attempts at this, we took a traditional engineering approach um, where you try to model the system in some way and then you have lots of fancy equations and you end up producing torques for the motors. This kind of works, I'm not gonna show you videos of it, um, but you know, the problem is it, it, was, it was brittle, it's tedious to design, difficult to extend. Okay, now we want it to skip. We want it to, to run. We want it to hop. It's a whole process to go through again. Um, and, you know, so, so uh, it's, this is more like the process that uh, Boston Dynamics will go through. And uh, they, they produce some amazing stuff uh, for, for sure. But it's an approach that I think requires a lot of money, time, and engineers, and we're a small lab. We, we can't, we don't have that amount of uh, money, time, and engineers to invest. So we, we wanted to, uh, as an academic lab, take a very different type of an approach. Uh, and, and this is what I mean by an alternative engineering approach, um, right? This is a traditional engineering approach and we're gonna study something new. Um, and probably a lot of you have heard about this, but uh, so, so uh, how do humans walk, right? We're, we're not programmed out of, the, out of the, the womb to walk. We're programmed to learn to walk. And if any of you, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have had children and or seen children learn to walk over the first 12 months of age. Most, you know, the average is 12 months it takes to take your first independent steps. 
but there, there's really interesting stages of development. So you'll see the infants want to roll over and they practice that for a while. And then they practice rocking and, and, and they, they learn all of these skills as their body's gaining strength and, and, and it's developing until they can walk. So humans are programmed to learn to walk. They're not programmed to walk. And so maybe, maybe we could consider doing something very similar. Can we program Cassie to learn to walk? And it turns out that we can do that. So and that's what a lot of this talk is gonna be about, most of this talk. And so I'm gonna go on to a little aside here um, uh, about the, the basic technology we're using to teach Cassie to walk. And, and it's a technology called reinforcement learning. Some of you may have heard of this. Um, but the name itself, it, this is a subfield of AI, which you might even you might even say it's a subfield of machine learning, which is itself a subfield of AI. Um, but but the name is inspired by by Pavlonian conditioning from Psychology 101, if you remember that, um, where uh, where uh, intelligent beings learn from rewards and punishments. And we'll just say there are positive and negative rewards and you learn to correlate behaviors with those positive and negative rewards. And that's exactly what, uh, what reinforcement learning is going to do. And we'll see how that's set up here. We're going to give Cassie a positive reward if the locomotion is good and you know we're good, we have to define, and a negative reward if Cassie falls over. And the learning involves trying to maximize the amount of reward you get over your lifetime, which if the rewards are what I just said, to maximize the reward, you're gonna to have to learn how to walk, how to move without falling. And this technology is actually, it's actually being used more and more now in industry. Uh, I still think it's not quite a technology in the sense that you can just use it out of the box. You still need some expertise, but a couple of high profile places where you might have seen it is this is a Netflix special. I haven't actually watched this yet. I, I actually saw that, you know, I was tracking this when it was actually happening. happening. Uh, but AlphaGo was a recent system that beat the world Go champion and, and sort of revolutionized. Um, well, basically, I think we're at the point now where in five years, people, you won't be at all surprised that computers beat a human in any sort of game. Um, it's just, yeah, computers can do that just like they can add numbers better than us. Uh, but this, this was a revolution in, in how well we were able to do that. The computer was able to play itself over and over and over, you know, 40 million games and eventually get learned to play well enough to beat the world champion. Pretty amazing. So go watch that on Netflix if you're if you're curious about that. Another thing that you may not may or may not know about is that this type of technology and sometimes simplified versions of it are basically used by social media companies to uh, to keep you engaged, right? So uh, you might say that they were <laughs> some of these technologies are are sort of at the core of you know a lot of the uh, the uh, criticisms you hear about these social media platforms. Uh, you, you hear about Facebook and Twitter predominantly, but really it's pervasive, right? Everybody wants clicks and we, we uh, will reward the algorithm if, it get, if we get a click, if you engage the user as a positive reward, maybe there's negative rewards, like if, if a user you know, logs out or, or something. But, but the, these technologies are actually pretty powerful. And, and in fact, you know, I'd say, I'd say what they're doing here is that they're actually solving relatively simple problems here. Like it's pretty easy to get humans uh, engaged on uh, electronics, um, but, but they, they work really well for these simple problems. So these are just two examples of where reinforcement learning has been used. Um, and today we're going to talk about the example of Cassie. I'm going to try to hide the meeting control. So, so what do we, what are we talking about here? So we've got Cassie here, and and 
uh, we're, we're developing this algorithm, this reinforcement learning algorithm, and it's going to take as input from Cassie the sensing, which is the joint positions. Um, and we're going to uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. And we're, it's also going to take in commands from a joystick that the human is saying what gate to do um, and, and, and all of that. And the intelligence has to say how to control the 10 motors. There's five motors on each leg. Um, and reinforcement learning, what we're gonna do is we're going to give Cassie rewards depending on how well the current locomotion matches what the commanded locomotion is, right? So falling definitely doesn't match the commanded locomotion, but we're rarely ever gonna command that. And so you get a negative reward, um, whereas, if we're saying to run it, you know, two meters per second and it's doing it perfectly, we'll give it a positive reward. So this is how we're going to set it up as a reinforcement learning problem. And you might, you know, so what, what are we actually going to put in place of this spongy uh, brain that I'm showing you? Well, we're going to put a, uh, a neural network. Um, so some of you may have, may have some familiarity with neural networks or at least have heard about them. They're not magic. Um, they're they're just a just a giant function in code that, that has a lot of parameters. And by adjusting the parameters of this function, right, it will uh, it will produce different outputs for the for for uh, for the inputs that it gets. And reinforcement learning is all about using these reward signals. Um, so so the agent is going to be practicing walking or practicing something and seeing the observed rewards. And reinforcement learning is all about how do you change the parameters of this function, a neural network in this case, so that the actions we output um, achieve high reward on average right, over time. And so there's a whole bunch of algorithms for this. Really, there's just two fundamental ones and then a whole bunch of variations on those. And, and today you might hear the term deep reinforcement learning. Um, that's just reinforcement learning where you have a neural network um, and the neural network is considered to be deep if it has many layers. Um, so that's, that's, if you hear the term deep reinforcement learning, that's all it is. It's reinforcement learning with a neural network. Um, and this has been done for a long time. It's just, we're, we're able, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we can do some pretty interesting things. We just hit that sort of, uh, threshold of computation and, and I guess, uh, willingness to try, right? And so sometimes it's just a matter of, oh yeah, they were able to do that. Well, maybe we could do this. Um, so, so bravery of, of trying, I think is always, uh, something that we don't appreciate enough. Um, so, so, so we got these reinforcement learning algorithms. We can throw it on Cassie and have Cassie practice walking, right? Right, there's no problem with that. Well, probably a lot of you are thinking this already. Well, there is a problem. Uh, reinforcement learning, it starts out with a random neural network. And what's that gonna do? Well, it's gonna fall, and it's gonna fall all the time. Uh, so, so children, you know, children fall a lot. They, they really do, they, they fall all the time too. Okay, I'm trying to get this video going. So, but they're built to fall, they're, they're squishy, right? And they, they can get right back up. They, they don't care, they're not phased by falling. Um, so we'll watch that infant move around. Cassie, on the other hand, um, we, we don't want Cassie falling too much, right? Cassie's gonna break if that happens very often. And Cassie does break. Every time Cassie breaks, we have to bring it back to agility and wait, and it kills our research. So our students are really good at breaking Cassie, but uh, we're trying to decrease the frequency of that. Um, uh, so, so there's no way that we could use reinforcement learning to train Cassie in the real world because Cassie would just, reinforcement learning is gonna require millions and hundreds of millions of, of steps of training. And by then Cassie's just gonna be broken uh, to bits. And so, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, Cassie, Cassie isn't squishy and um, as uh, robust as, as an infant. So what can we do? 
Well, um, one idea would be, well, we could maybe learn in simulation. So do all the reinforcement learning in simulation. And then maybe we'll take that neural network that we learned in simulation and put it on the real robot and see what it does in the real world. Seems like it might be viable. There's a lot of, a lot of question marks there, but, but that would be great if we could do it um, because simulation is fast, much faster than real time, parallelizable. We can run this on a hundred computers in parallel if we want. And there's no broken robots in simulation. We don't care if the robot falls down. You can fall down a million times and, and we, we don't care. So the question is, could this work? Um, now, now what, what we were able to do after, this just this took about a year and a half to figure out how to do it, is to train Cassie in simulation. Um, so it could just walk around in simulation. Um, it takes about 12 to 24 hours of training. Uh, we use uh, Intel's uh, B Labs and clusters they, they, they let us use. Um, uh, we, I don't know how many, pro how many processes we're doing in parallel. I think it's the order of 50, something like that. But, but it turns out to be about 1.3 years worth of training. Um, so we train for about, on average, 100 million steps of training before you get robust locomotion. So it's, it's a lot of training, it's brute force. It's okay, it's simulation, we can do brute force training. Does it work in the real world though? That's, that's the real question, right? So showing these things in simulation is one thing, but roboticists will just laugh at you until you can show it in the real world. And this was the very first time that we got something trained in simulation and, and showing something in the real world. Um, not uh, so, so it walked, we can say that, um, maybe not the most impressive or robust. You wouldn't bet money that it's not gonna fall if you just trip it up a little bit, but it was, it was the first demonstration that we were able to uh, do this, train in simulation and then directly go to the real robot. And, and you, you've gotta be, you've gotta really take care that your simulation is capturing a lot of the, uh, the, the real things that are going on in the robot, such as delays between, you know, the, the commands and the actuations, um, a lot of things about you know, reflected inertia, things like that. Um, so, so we got that to work, but was it wasn't robust. Uh, so so here's, a, here's a basic robustness test. So we're, we, you, 10 trials or nine trials, I guess. We got some Hollywood squares going on here. And you can see most of them don't last too long. They just kind of fall. I think these two, I don't know if these two fall at the end or not, but you're not gonna bet money um, on, the, on this robot uh, unless you're betting that it's gonna fall. Um, so so, so, that, so, so the, the obvious problem here is that the simulation isn't gonna match all of the dynamics of the real environment. And reinforcement learning will eventually sort of over customize or overfit to that simulation. And then when it gets to a world where things aren't quite matching up well, it doesn't really work as well as we'd like, as well as we saw in simulation. So what could you do? Um, well, what you could do is, uh, one, one thing that you could do is, what we call dynamics randomization. So this is the second idea, um, well, third idea. So the first idea is use reinforcement learning. Second idea is, oh, well, we can't train in the real world, so we'll do sim to real. Third idea is dynamics randomization. So we're gonna randomize the dynamics when we train. So every time we train, we're gonna randomize the physical parameters within some ranges. Um, and then the, the trained policy has to be robust to all kinds of little differences. And what you're hoping is that it will then be robust to the real world, because that's gonna be different from any of these individual runs, but hopefully overall, um, dynamics randomization will let us work. And here's an example of when you train the robot in simulation with, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one, this one with dynamics randomization. Same reinforcement learning algorithm. The only thing we've changed is that during training, every run we, we randomize the simulator. You can see these are all gonna survive. 
Maybe you would be willing to bet money they won't fall walking on a treadmill. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, this was a nice point to get to, but it's a little boring just walking, right? So, so humans can do all kinds of things. We skip sometimes, I don't know why, but I guess it's fun or uh, birds hop. They do some pretty interesting things as well. Uh, and we'd like our robot to be able to do these things, but it's not clear how to even tell a robot what it means to skip or hop. And so that's one of the problems we had to, had to solve. What, what do you do with this controller to tell the robot to hop or skip? Um, there's a whole space of possible bipedal gates from standing, we'll call that a gate, walking, hopping, galloping, skipping, and everything in between. How can we describe these in a way that Cassie can understand and we can reward, the, give a reward signal that says how close you are to skipping, for example. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we, uh, we figured out how to do last year. Um, we had a paper on this. And the idea is actually really simple. Um, so what you'll notice, this is, I'm gonna show you the example of how we do this with unipedal hopping, so just one leg. So what you'll notice is that there's two phases. One phase, the hopper is on the ground, and the other phase, it's in the air. And all we're gonna do is note that when the hopper is on the ground, the foot velocity should be zero, but the foot force should be greater than zero. And likewise, when you're in the air, the velocity should be greater than zero, but the foot force should be zero. And with those constraints, we set up a clock where we can specify there's a swing phase and a stance phase. And we say here, there's a cost to having a force during the swing phase. In the stance phase, there's no cost, it's a zero cost. And likewise, we have a cost for velocity in the stance phase. And this can be turned into a reward signal. So our, our input to the controller now will have a clock and we're gonna give it positive and negative rewards depending on the force and velocity of the foot and what phase you're in. And with this, you can control where this transition happens and you can specify it for both feet. And through a small number of knobs, you can actually uh, get all kinds of bipedal behaviors. So I'm not gonna go over the details, but this is showing you a picture of where the knobs are set. You can get hopping. So, so we, we train the robot in simulation with all kinds of variations of these knobs to give different gates. And the, the controller input, the, the neural network then learns, oh, with these knob settings, it means to hop. Uh, different knob settings. So here you'll notice that uh, uh, this is one foot, this is the other. There's an offset here, right? That's the, there's a period of time when both feet are on the ground, so walking. You can even, if you go two periods and have knobs for, for these two periods, you can even get skipping. And I can't tell you how surprised we were when we actually saw this work on the treadmill. Uh, pretty surprising. And, and here's Jonah with his joystick and knobs telling it to go from walking by turning some knobs to skipping, right? So it can even transition sort of in real time between these things uh, gracefully. So that's pretty interesting. So, so we were able to get quite a few uh, behaviors that way. And it was a very simple idea, but still just within the sim to real framework, um, training and simulation, and then going to the real world. What happens when you put it on stairs? Of course, the students had to experiment all over campus with things. Sometimes they could get it to go up and down stairs, but not reliably. We were curious if you could. Um, and so the idea is, well, how about we train it in simulation to go up and down lots of stairs? And that's exactly what we did. Remember the robot's blind here. So it's a surprise when a stair comes up to it, but, but it learns a gate that can respond to when a stair emerges and when a stair, both uphill and downhill. Um, so it's always a surprise. 
uh, you know, this would be a scary thing to do as a human. And, and during training, it probably falls in many different ways and it learns to recover from different types of falls. Um, so, so after all of that training, so, so do this for a hundred million steps, um, does it work in the real world? I thought, no way it's gonna work in the real world. But the students, they tend to be more optimistic than me, which is a very good thing. Um, they took it out there and marched it all around campus, up and down stairs, right? So this is just one of the stairs. And of course, after they get bored of stairs, they, they start doing, uh, so they're not supporting the robot with this thing. This is just like, the, we don't want Cassie to break. Their footwork is actually pretty impressive in, in some of these cases. So they got bored of stairs after a while and they, uh, they wanted to start playing in different parts of campus just to see what it could do. Like it's not trained to do any of these things, but they just wanted to exercise. It was never trained to do something like this, but they discovered that it could do it because it's, Train, it's done a lot of things in simulation and we don't really know the limits of what it can do. So it can go up and down a grassy hill, um, just trying to save a little time here. It can do things like that. This one here, is this one's fairly impressive. It gets stuck in the log and keeps on going. This is probably my favorite one. So, so, so it's blind, remember. So it's going to get in some sticky situations sometimes. And, and here's one of them, right? Okay, this looks like it might not go so well. You can watch the human legs too. They, humans are really robust. But it falls backwards and it, it learns to recover. But, but it's probably done something like this, you know, thousands of times in simulation because it's had to recover in simulation. So... But Cassie's like, yeah, no problem. I'm just gonna plow ahead. Um, looks a lot like a running back, just continues to pump the legs. Uh, so so that was, that was really, really, I mean, that far exceeded what we ever expected to do um, in, in that time frame. But then, yeah, we were, so those were all kind of interesting demonstrations. But one of the, one of the things we brag about with bipedal locomotion is the efficiency, energy efficiency. So what, what can we do to demonstrate that? Well, we thought maybe an endurance demonstration, something like a 5K might be interesting. Uh, when we started practicing and training for this, we noticed right off the bat that there were some problems. Uh, Cassie's, we'll say sneakers, get, get worn through a lot. And this is because the, the policies that were learned, they had a twisting motion for the, for the feet and also a fairly high impact. So it's like a runner that has too hard of an impact. Um, and so, so we, we figured we had to fix that before running a 5K. And so what we did is we trained. It's a little loud because it, you know, but just notice the stompiness of this original game. very stompy um, and after we trained it we trained it with a penalty for stompiness we'll say so retrain the policy and it has a much lighter I'll turn off the sound but you'll you'll just see that visually it's much lighter footed we'll say and this hopefully, uh, you know, saves a lot of wear on the robot. It's like a runner, if they learn to run uh, more, with more fluid, uh, you know, dynamics and, and lighter steps, they're gonna last longer too. So after that, um, we were able to run a 5K. This is around campus, outdoors. And uh, yeah, this was the first successful 5K um, ever for a bipedal robot. And uh, yeah, we were, it was a, there were two falls. Like I wouldn't brag about this uh, 
I like this as a jogger in the background. I don't know what she's thinking about this. Um, but uh, two falls, one, the, the student was a little too aggressive going around the corner. The other, the, the uh, computer overheated and Cassie passed out. But if a human passes out and gets up and finishes a 5K, we'll say they finished the 5K. So not a time to brag about with these two falls, but but it was the first one ever. And yeah, we're pretty proud of it. Um, so, so we're doing some other fun things. Uh, I'm basically at the end now. I just want to give you a sense of things we're doing now. So we're interested in now working on Cassie with loads, different types of loads, not just its own body, because these loads change the dynamics of the entire system. So crazy things like this. And can you get, this is sort of modeling sloshing. Can you get sim to real to work here? All right, so I think this is my favorite. The students got a couple of containers of cat litter and <laughs> put them on this contraption. So, so, so you can see the sim to real gap is getting a little larger. Like, you know, this is, it's walking, but boy, yeah. It could could be learning to do that better, but this is pretty hard, right? It, uh, it doesn't have a torso. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. Uh, the other thing we're doing now is we've just recently put a real sense camera on Cassie. And this is gonna let us do some more, have more foresight and do more planning. And you know, ultimately we wanna do things like this in the real world. Of course, we're not gonna have these Cliffs, but we can put down stepping stones that Cassie now has to have has to use perception. So this is we're doing this now in simulation. Um, so Cassie can now plan out where to put the steps. Uh, we're hoping in the next month or two, um, next conference cycle, that we can can get this going on the real robot. So that's our next uh, fun challenge. So, so finally, I want to, you know, we, we can say the sim to real thing was pretty, worked pretty well for us. It, it wasn't clear that it would work in the beginning. Does it work in the real world? Well, it seemed to work surprisingly well. It does have its limits. I think we're starting to see them. Um, and, and that's really the next frontier. And, and the, way, the way I want you to you know, bring this back to uh, an engineering paradigm, you know, you know think about, if you have control problems, think about them. Some of them are not always going to fit in a sim to real framework. But if you can invest in simulation, um, it's quite a viable approach. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of way of engineering these systems. So your simulator, your application. Um, and, and I think it's a very compelling to think about what industrial problems there are that, that might be amenable to this. And with that, I think I will just stop and, and thank our sponsors. Uh, this, this work has been sponsored by DARPA, NSF, and Intel has given us a lot of support through compute um, and help support the lab as well. So thanks. And I'm happy to take any questions if we have time for that. So we've got whoever wants to stick around, I'm, I'm fine to stick around till, till noon. Um, So, okay, so Carrie said, fascinating movie. Oh, that was about AlphaGo. Yeah, I should watch that. I just don't have a lot of Netflix time. So are there any questions? No plans for Cassie movies yet. Yeah. Usually, as the moderator, I ask my I, I ask a question, but I'm not going to ask myself a question. Well, if there are no questions, uh, as I said, if you are interested in the technical stuff, there's a uh, there are there's a longer version of this talk uh, online, and that will go into what we use for reinforcement learning and uh, some other 
detailed things that, that the uh, the more engineer uh, you know more more of the uh, the engineer types may like to see. But uh, yeah, so so if everybody's happy with the uh, with questions, uh, let me just make sure. So Kiri has a question. Has Cassie developed any gates that are not familiar to humans? Hmm. Well, um, yeah, it's a, a good question. Um, I mean, Cassie is, I mean, you can, you, we have a whole library of weird Cassie gates. Um, you know, this would be, you'll see things like this, um, but this looks like Cassie's happy and maybe humans do this sometime. But there's uh, there's certainly uh, weird things that we see. Some of the some of the weird things we see are uh, Cassie exploiting aspects of the simulator. So we've seen things, for example, where Cassie will like vibrate its feet and be able to move along. That it almost looks like it's doing a moonwalk forward. Um, so we see things like that that aren't pr they're probably not physically realistic. Um, but you'll see those in simulation. So yeah, you always have to, uh, reinforcement learning uh, can give you some crazy solutions sometimes. And, and that's partly why, you know, it, it takes, that's part of the engineering uh, framework, you know, being able to design that reward function. So you avoid the crazy things and, and get the good things. So good question, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that's why I was wondering, because if you specify some constraints or rewards, sometimes the method for getting there is not what you were expecting. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yeah, you, we, we, we've seen, we've seen all kinds of weird, um, weird things. So, so for example, when, when we started trying to teach it to go up and down stairs, instead of going up and down stairs, it, the reward was set up in a way that it just ended up sitting on a stair and, you know, moving its butt up and down on the stair because that, that's, and then you're like, oh yeah, the reward is actually, that's actually a way to optimize the reward. We're not telling it everything it needs to be told. Um, and that's a big part of the art um, that, yeah, unfortunately there's not a principled way to do that yet. It's like, yeah, it's objective function uh, hacking more or less.